So we're looking at Matthew chapter 1, and I'm just going to pick out, you've had most of it already read to you in a rather interesting way. I'm just going to pick out one or two verses that um, strike me to be important to draw your attention to. So let's just read verse 1 of Matthew chapter 1. It says, a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then verse 6 And Jesse, the father of King David, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. And then verse 11. And Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brother at the time of the exile to Babylon. And then 16 and 17. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Thus there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Christ. So just keep that open and we'll be referring back to Matthew chapter 1 as we consider this word. Let's pray, shall we? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our Lord and Redeemer. Amen. I wonder, um, how many of you enjoy detective stories, either reading them or on television? Yeah, a few? No, I thought it would be more than that, actually. I, I love them. I mean, I, I love all that kind of stuff. Um, and as you read a detective story, you're looking for clues, aren't you? Anything a little bit unusual, anything out of the ordinary, and it can indicate who did it. Yeah? So you're watching for something that surprises you in the narrative that you're reading or having presented um, on television. And in a similar way, when we come to the Bible, it can be a really helpful way of reading the Bible to say, what is surprising in this text? What surprises me about it? And that can give you clues as to what the intentions of the author were in writing the narrative that we are, in fact, reading. So what I want us to do as we come to this narrative of Matthew chapter 1 is to look at three surprises from this narrative and see what they tell us. So we're going to start off by the surprise of having the genealogy at the start of Matthew. Um, I don't know, if you were trying to grab people's attention, would this be the way to do it? You just look at it, you know. God, you know, it goes on and on and on. I mean, with the earth and cheers, we just about managed to get through it, didn't we? But what is he doing? Why is it here? I mean, he starts his book by a record of names, hardly memorable. You know, you don't say, wow, did you just get that first bit of Matthew? Wasn't it a great read? It doesn't sort of get you to turn the page. It almost gets you to want to close the book. And of course, we've got to think it's not just the beginning of Matthew. It's the beginning of the whole of the New Testament. When they were ordering the books, they put this one first. First, wouldn't you have put John? I'd have loved to have put John. In the beginning was, was the Word, and the Word was with God. But no, they put Matthew. So the big surprise is, why is it here? Why is this genealogy actually in our text? Did Matthew have a bad day? You know, what was Matthew trying to do? Well, I think we can see a number of things he's trying to do. Um, And I want to highlight a few of those. First of all, just have a look at what he's doing in terms of the very first verse. A record of the genealogy of Jesus, Jesus Christ, son of David and son of Abraham. You see, what Matthew is doing is saying, look... There's something really important about to happen. Jesus is about to be born. But you're only going to understand what this Jesus is about if you understand what has come before. So you need to know about Abraham. You need to know about David. I mean, sometimes we give out, don't we, New Testaments with the Psalms or something. And in some ways, although it's a bit thinner and a bit cheaper, it's a travesty. Because you can't understand the New Testament until you have an idea of what the Old Testament said. Does that make sense? And Matthew is saying absolutely that. You need to know that Jesus' is great, 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 great was Abraham and King David. So he's trying to make a point of connecting 
the Old Testament with the New Testament. And isn't that a great bridge? Isn't it a great bridge to do that, to have it as the first book of the New Testament? So why do you think he is saying, first of all, about this King David and King Abraham? Now, I'm going to be flicking around to various other texts. You might want to turn to them, or you might want to just let me read them to you. Um, We start off with King David as being mentioned. And if you look in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 and 13, it says this. When your days are over and you rest with your friends, speaking of King David, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Okay. Now, who was David's son? Did you remember that in the genealogy? Solomon, yeah? And what did he do? We did lots of things, but in terms of the text I've just read, he rebuilt the temple, didn't he? But did he live forever? No. He did not live forever. Neither did the temple remain forever. So we have this promise to King David that there's going to be a temple rebuilt. Well, certainly that was done in Solomon. um, Fully done in you and I. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. But this king whose kingdom will last forever, that's not true of Solomon. It is true of Jesus. Okay? So can you see that this being a son of King David, we see it partially fulfilled in Solomon, but fully fulfilled in Jesus. Does that make sense? In that line. We're told that he's also the son of Abraham. And you might want to turn this time to Genesis chapter 12, or I'll read it to you. And we're looking at verses 1 to 3. And this is a promise that God makes to Abraham. The Lord had said to Abraham, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Well, I mean, certainly Abraham was the father of a great nation. We've seen that, the people of Israel. We also see that his his descendants were blessed. They were secured and saved from all sorts of difficulties. But in terms of them being a blessing to others, that is partial, if if that. And that promise was still to be fulfilled. The fact that the lineage of Abraham would be a blessing to every nation. So we see it partially fulfilled, but not fully fulfilled. And then Jesus comes. Jesus comes. And he establishes, yes, he He blesses people, but they then turn out to be blessings to others. And it cuts across every nation, every nation of the world. Can you see how he's the son of King David? His kingdom will last forever. He is the son of Abraham, and Abraham's blessing is fully fulfilled in him. So this genealogy may surprise you, but you see in Jesus a fulfillment of the promises made to King David and to Abraham And in them, we see Jesus fulfilling them completely. So we see that the promises that have been made hundreds of years before are now fulfilled in Christ and through his church. And so we see then that if God makes a promise, we can trust it. So as we read the Bible, we read other promises, which we may say, well, I can't quite see them working out yet. We look at this text and we say, wow. Well, it did work out in Christ. We can trust the promises of God. So that's the first surprise I wanted to really point out to you. The fact that the genealogy is there is a bit of a surprise. But what a great link between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And how much has Jesus fulfilled what was promised in both Abraham and in King David? Secondly, I think it's a pretty surprising some of the people in this list. 
Now, I have not done my family tree. I've not gone back even two, like two or three generations I can do. And I do occasionally let out some information about my family tree. I don't know whether I've told any of you. But my grandfather, Bill Findlay, who you've not met, I doubt, was the manager of Watford, Watford Football Club. Did you know that? Okay, that's a bit of information I just wanted to give out to you. Um, and this may explain why, well, it doesn't explain why I hate football. <laughs> but it does explain why my three children love football. And um, whenever I say to Dawn, what are they doing this evening? Where are they going this evening? She goes, you know where they're going. I said, what? Football. I said, well, what kind of football? Well, I don't know, but you guarantee they're doing something to do with football. So there we go. There's one piece of information in my family tree that I've sh I share with you now and that I'm actually quite pleased about. I never met Bill Findlay. He died at 50 of a heart attack, sadly. Oh, dear, I'm 50 next year. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> my mother... <coughs> don't worry, I had my well-man check at, um, at the surgery, and they said I was OK for another... Another 10,000 miles or something. Um, my mother, however, my mother's mother, is a worse story. And this is one which I don't tell that many people, but obviously I am today because I'm telling you guys. Sadly, um, my mother's mother, who again I never met, after Bill Findlay died, her husband, um, she was so not coping with life, and she had four children, that she lay back in an oven and committed suicide. That's my mother's mother. My mother then had terrible skin problems and eventually died of multiple sclerosis. I don't think it's unconnected. So my family tree has got some, you know, interesting stuff in it and some stuff which is pretty bad, you know. I bet yours does as well. We won't do a great confession at this point, but um, the good, the bad and the ugly is most people's family tree, frankly. But have a look at this family tree in Matthew. Verse 2, Jacob, Jacob, the cheat, cheated his brother out of the birthright. Great guy, huh? Wouldn't you love him to be your brother on your family tree? Verse 3, Judah and Tamar. Tamar that Judah was guilty of incest with. Great family tree. Wouldn't you have airbrushed some of this out? I mean, do we have to mention it? How about verse 5? Rahab, a Gentile, a Gentile prostitute. A Gentile in a Jewish genealogy. My word. And a prostitute in the line of the saviour of the world. How about verse 7? Rehoboam. i am not got very far. I'm going to stop in a minute. Who oppressed the whole nation under his leadership. And it goes on. What on earth is this here for? Why has Matthew included, and he doesn't, you know, it's not as if he kind of misses out the bad bits. He almost emphasises the bad bits. What a hopeless bunch. Let's get back to the good guys, shall we? King David, there's a good guy. Also a low point, wasn't it? Um, but it's not glossed over in the text. Verse 6, have a look. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Uriah's wife. Well, in fact, um, it kind of makes it sound quite good there, doesn't it? But it actually, he took Bathsheba, didn't he? While she was still married. And then he killed Uriah by putting him on the front line in battle. So the good guy, David, is hardly a good guy in terms of, if you take his whole life, he did some terrible things. Psalm 51 he wrote after he killed Bathsheba, or killed Uriah. So here we are, the lovely family tree of Jesus, including adulterers, prostitutes and murderers, all in the line of the saviour. A list, the list is surely an embarrassment, surely a list of shame, isn't it? All in the ancestry of Jesus. And Matthew draws our attention to this motley crew. What is he doing? Now, do you remember, remember Jesus being described as a friend of? It's not surprising, is it really? He liked his family, he knew his family line, and he was a friend of sinners. We start to understand a little more of his family tree, do we? I think we do. Now, a friend of sinners can be a bit of a strange term of phrase. Now, 
A doctor is a friend of the sick. Does that make sense? They're a friend of the sick. Does that mean to say they, they want the sick to remain sick? <laughs> they don't, do they? Um, now, you know, if somebody is a doctor, they actually hate sickness, don't they? They want to deal with the sickness. They want to get rid of the sickness. And in that way, Jesus is a friend of sinners. Yeah? He came to destroy the power of sin and death. Jesus does not condone or turn a blind eye. He certainly doesn't cover up sin in this genealogy, does he? But he's not ashamed of sinners. He's a friend of sinners and sees his task as loving those sinners and dying for those sinners that they might be forgiven. Jesus understands sin and Jesus is the end of the line in terms of sin. He has the power to deal with sin. Notice the family tree doesn't go on, does it? He has the power to deal with sin. And not only that, but he's willing to adopt you and I into his family. Not in the bloodline, but adopted into this family. Are you honoured by that? Or do you dislike some of these guys? You don't want to be in this family. He welcomes sinners into his family and has the power to clean them up and make them his sons and daughters of the king of kings. So secondly, we've got this surprise of who's in the family tree. So why is the family tree there? Because it shows us the link between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It shows us that Jesus is the everlasting king. His kingdom will have no end. And also that his kingdom and his people will be a blessing to all nations. And secondly, we see in this text that in the family tree of Jesus, he's honest about all those in the family tree. And he's a friend of sinners, but deals with the sin. The third surprise, and I do find this quite fascinating, is the emphasis given in this narrative to the exile. Did you notice? We've got lists and lists of names, but the only event included is the exile. Did you notice? Now, what else could have been there if you, if you were doing the family tree of Jesus? What would you put in? I can think of a number of things I'd put in. Any thoughts? We're not moving on until you answer. Any thoughts? What would you put? The exiles mentioned. Nothing else is mentioned. The building of the the, rebuilding of the temple. The building of the temple. Fantastic. Thank you, Penny. Any others? The tearing of the temple curtain. That's after he's arrived. So we want to think of the Old Testament. So Jesus comes and does that, doesn't he? And it'd be great moving into the New Testament. But if you were doing the family tree, looking back over the Old Testament, what would you include in the Old Testament? Why wouldn't you? Isn't it just begging for it, Paul? Where is the Exodus? The Exodus, isn't that the big one? Go on and on. But it's not mentioned, is it? What's mentioned? The exile. Would that have been the first one you'd have thought of? So why? Why is it there? Why is he making a point about the exile? Do you remember the exile? He had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom all taken into captivity. No longer are they in the land. No longer is the temple even stone upon stone. They've been exiled. The king's died. Everything's gone. What is going on? And why is Matthew including all of this? In fact, the exile is mentioned three times in verse 11, uh, 12, and 17. The exile is the only event to be mentioned in the genealogy. You see, the king, the temple, the land were all part of a model revealing God's purposes. If you look in the Old Testament, they were a model revealing God's purposes. He wanted to be with his people, he wanted to have a place for them, and he wanted to be their king through the king who was appointed. But it's just a model. And now in exile, that model has been destroyed, hasn't it? They've gone into exile, the model has been destroyed. Let's look at the model. I think we may have this on the screen. So the Old Testament, the model was... God's people were the nation of Israel. God's place was the land of Canaan. And God's rule came through the king and through the law. And the exile, what did it do? Well, the nation of Israel was scattered. The land of Canaan is overrun by foreigners. And the king dies in exile. And the law is forgotten. 
Can you see what's happened? The model has been broken. And I think Matthew, the fact that he mentions the exile three times, I think he's trying to get us to see that this has ended. And a whole new kingdom is being established. So what is that new kingdom? What is the new rule? We've got another slide now. The New Testament, what does that show us? Well, there's a whole new thing happening. The God's people are the followers of Jesus, the church. God's place is where Jesus rules and reigns. And that is every place where he is named Saviour and Lord. And God's rule comes through the rule of Jesus, the amazing freedom of the people of God. And the whole law is summed up in loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength and loving our neighbour as if they were ourselves. Can you see what's happened here? Can you see and perhaps surmise as to why Matthew thinks it's a good idea to emphasise the exile? I would put to you that he was trying to point out that something's ended and something is about to begin. A whole new kingdom is now being established through this one, even Jesus Christ. So in summary, Matthew is keen to show that the plan started far before the birth of Jesus is now coming to light in fresh ways. In fact, what was there before was almost like the backcloth of the main event that is about to break into the world. Jesus, son of David, so king, son, of, son of King David, son of Abraham, reminds us that Jesus is the king forever, and through him all nations will be blessed. The genealogy reminds us that this is a list of sinful people, and he came as a friend of sinners, and invites you and I to be adopted into his family. And finally, Matthew gives great importance to, to the exile. Matthew is emphasising that the exile is a key moment in the life of Israel. And when it becomes clear that the model is broken and everything points to the coming Messiah, even Jesus. Finally then, at the end of Matthew's Gospel, you might want to just have a look right at the end. What does it say? Matthew 28, verse 19. Therefore go... And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Do you notice Matthew says now? He starts off by saying, look, something's breaking in. The kingdom of Jesus is breaking in. And how does he end his gospel? He then says, you guys... Go and bless those around you. Go and make disciples. Can you see? Can you see that Jesus was the source of blessing for all, not just for a few, not just for one nation? And how does he achieve that blessing for all? He says, go, make disciples of all nations. He says, go, invite your friends in this evening, tomorrow, Christmas Day, get them along, let them hear the gospel. Invite them into your homes, tell them, why this season is so special to you. Go and make disciples. Can you see that ultimately Matthew is saying that the blessing may not have flowed through King David and Abraham, but it most assuredly does through Jesus, and the blessing is passed on through his church, through you and through I, through me. So let us turn to God in prayer, shall we, and respond to this surprising, prophetic and life-giving word. Let us pray. Our Father, when we come to those parts of Scripture that we find a bit confusing, difficult to understand, um, we do pray for the illumination of your Spirit as we read. We do thank you that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for our instruction and for training up in righteousness. And we pray individually and as a church that this preached word and the words preached over the coming days and weeks of Christmas and the New Year will breathe life into your people and into this area. We pray that these words will not just be words, but the source of great blessing for all nations. We ask this in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Saviour. Amen.